The British army of the late 18th century was dragged into the French Revolutionary Wars, which began in 1792. By the end of the year, Britain had expelled the French ambassador after the execution of Louis XIV and had declared that war was inevitable unless France gave up her previous conquests. France had assured Britain that she would not invade Holland or the Low Countries, the neutrality of which were key to Britain's national security and had been since Elizabethan times. However, tensions came to a head when France declared war on Britain on the 1st of February 1793, ensuring Britain would be involved in the French wars, first the revolutionary and then the Napoleonic for the next 22 years. This would prove to be one of the longest continual conflicts that she had been engaged with in modern times. In 1793, the British army was small and confusingly administered, numbering around 40,000 men. It reached its peak in 1813, when the strength numbered about 250,000 men. However, this was still dwarfed by some of the Continental armies, Napoleon's Grand Armée reaching a strength of about 650,000 in 1812, for example. The British way of war, up to and including the First World War, was to field a small army, rely on the navy to halt any invasion, and bankroll her allies against the more sizeable continental forces. This system had worked well, and the British army was the only military force not to suffer a major reverse at the hands of Napoleonic France, according to historian Philip Haythornwaite. In terms of men in the field, France's population was roughly double that of Britain's 16 million, but Britain was able to draw on her financial and industrial output to help the defeat of France. By paying for Austrian and Russian soldiers and equipment, Britain added approximately 450,000 men to these two European armies throughout the wars. Government-backed smuggling of products into continental Europe also helped, despite France's attempts at naval blockades. Another factor that helped was that France just didn't have the same industrial and financial base and had to rely on conquered territories to provide men and equipment, which in turn brought its own problems of resentment and resistance. As with all the armies of the period, the British army was split into three arms, the infantry, the cavalry and the artillery. The infantry made up the largest proportion of the force, with the cavalry second and then in third place the artillery. In the year that Britain entered the war with France, the army was comprised of three regiments of household cavalry, 27 line regiments of cavalry, 7 battalions of foot guards and 81 line battalions of infantry. The infantry were split across 77 regiments and were sequentially numbered. Added to this, there was two colonial corps, one in Canada and one in New South Wales in Australia. In the garrisons and forts across the United Kingdom were 36 independent companies of invalids, which were known by their commanders' names. The artillery was administered by the Board of Ordnance and was a separate entity, overseeing 40 companies divided into four battalions, with 10 companies of artillery in the invalid battalion, two independent companies in India and a final company of cadets. In 1793, the Royal Horse Artillery was still in the process of being organised. Along with the artillery being under the separate jurisdiction of the Board of Ordnance, troops were controlled by local government departments depending on where they were stationed. So the troops in Ireland would fall under the Irish establishment rather than the War Office in London. The first steps towards formalisation of the army as a whole body came when 15 general officers were appointed to command military districts in England and Wales in 1793. Over the next few years, the Duke of York, as Commander-in-Chief of the Army, brought about reforms that did away with corporal punishment for minor offences. It cracked down on corruption and the buying of promotions for officers. In the reforms, officers had to have served for two years before being promoted to captain and six years before being promoted to major. This simple change ensured that the officers were men of experience and allowed for promotion through the ranks. During the Napoleonic Wars, 5% of the officers were such men, and the number of bought commissions fell to around 20%. Officers were supposed to be gentlemen, but this referred more to his conduct than his social standing. Far from perfect, this system still allowed for good officers to rise through the ranks and gave Britain an edge that a lot of other European armies just didn't have. Traditionally, the men in the ranks were men who had fallen on hard times in civilian life, and took the lower pay of the soldier in order to survive. Joining the army was not a glamorous nor envious perspective, and Wellington once said of them, the scum of the earth, it is really wonderful that we should have made them the fine fellows they are. The men were not all drawn from the lower social classes though. In Scotland, the collapse of the weaving industry meant that a lot of artisans and middle class men were forced to join. The low pay was bolstered somewhat by the Duke of York introducing daily beer money in 1800. Then in 1806, 
a change was made from lifelong service for the majority to limited service of seven years for the infantry, ten years for the artillery and cavalry. Both of these reforms served to attract more recruits throughout the Napoleonic Wars. Within the infantry, there existed a number of different types of units. The foot guards consisted of three regiments, each with two or three battalions, and these men were better paid, better trained, and more highly motivated than the rest of the army. They were also expected to maintain a higher level of rigorous discipline than the line infantry. The line infantry was divided into regiments, each numbered, and after 1781, given a geographical designation, which roughly equated to the area that the unit was recruited. However, this was not rigidly applied, and there would be a mix of English, Irish, Welsh and Scots within all regiments. The majority of regiments consisted of two battalions, but again this was not rigid, and some only had one battalion, whilst the 60th foot eventually had seven battalions. The separate battalions of each regiment were brigaded throughout the army, and it was rare that the same battalions from a regiment served together within a brigade. Although the battalion was a basic battlefield unit, it was further divided into companies, of which there were ten in total. Eight companies made up the centre, with two flank companies. The flank companies consisted of the grenadiers and the light infantry. The grenadier company was made up of the bravest and strongest men, and was used as the vanguard of the attack. The light company was used for scouting, skirmishing, and consisted of the most agile men. A line infantry battalion was commanded by a colonel or lieutenant colonel, with the companies commanded by a captain. Below this level were numerous lieutenants and ensigns to control the companies in the field. Ideally, the battalion had a strength of a thousand men, but this was a paper strength, and injuries, sickness, death, and various other factors ensured that most battalions operated at well below this number. Campaigns would further add to this attrition, and the 1st Battalion would draw men from the 2nd Battalion to maintain strength during active service. The line infantry were armed with a brown best musket, and were trained in rapid fire and reloading. After the American War of Independence, Major General Dundas had advocated that close order formations should be introduced, to allow for a large amount of firepower to be drawn against an enemy. His 1792 drill book became the standard drill for the infantry, and the rigid firing of the British infantry and lines has become some stuff of legend. However, the historian Paddy Griffith has pointed out that although the drill and training would allow this, in battle the situation was somewhat different, and the British soldiers seemed to prefer to fire a volley at an oncoming enemy than charge with fixed bayonets to fight in close combat. The light infantry were a separate entity to the line infantry, and light battalions were formed in the early part of the Napoleonic and Revolutionary Wars after experiences in Flanders had shown that the French light infantry were not only more numerous, but more experienced than the British in the 1790s. German émigrés in 1795 formed the first rifle unit of the 5th Battalion of the 60th Foot Regiment. In 1800, an experimental corps of riflemen were formed and armed with the British Baker rifle. In 1802, this was renamed as the famous 95th Rifle of Foot, the men were clad in green uniforms and saw extensive service, particularly in the peninsula where the rocky landscape suited their skirmishing and the sharpshooter tactics. Two light infantry regiments were created by Sir John Moore in 1803, and these were the 43rd and 52nd regiments of foot. They were trained at Shawncliffe Camp, which was a specialised camp for training light infantry. Later, the 51st, 68th, 71st, 85th and 90th regiments were also added to the light infantry roster. The light infantry were trained in using their initiative on the battlefield, and punishment for minor infractions was dropped, and a system of reward for good conduct was also introduced. The light infantry and rifle battalions were comprised of eight companies, and light infantry were also trained to form in close order and operate as normal line infantry, along with their light infantry duties. The light infantry also carried a new pattern musket with a rudimentary backsight for allowing to firing at individual targets, rather than the volley fire preferred by the line infantry. The British infantry wore red coats for the most part, which was supplied by the regimental colonel through contracts, meaning there was little uniformity across the entire army. Trousers were woolen, white in colour for summer, and grey for winter, although again there were huge differences in the colours supplied. Some Scottish Highland regiments wore kilts and feather bonnets, some of these then changed the kilts to trues in 1809. In 1800 the previously wore bicorn was changed to the cylindrical stovepipe shako. In 1812, the Belgic Chaco was introduced, featuring a false front and tassels. The Grenadiers and Guards continued to wear bearskins, but not whilst on campaign. Officers were expected to supply their own uniforms, 
and these were variable in style and quality given the difference in individual officers' means. At the beginning of the Napoleonic Wars, the British heavy cavalry consisted of 16 regiments, three of which were the Household Cavalry, seven regiments of Dragoon Guards and six of Dragoons. The term heavy was applied, but in reality it was closer to the French classification of medium cavalry. The Light Cavalry was a force of 14 regiments of Light Dragoons. The Light Cavalry's primary role was scouting and patrolling ahead of the army, and they had originally formed part of the Heavy Cavalry until they were separated and then expanded. In 1806, four regiments of Hussars were formed from four of the Light Dragoon regiments. These were costlier to equip due to the expensive uniforms they wear, but their role remained the same. Later in the wars, the uniforms of the cavalry changed. From 1812, they began to resemble the French cavalry in their appearance. Wellington objected to these changes as he thought it was difficult to differentiate the opposing forces at long distances. Because Britain is an island, the army kept a much smaller contingent of cavalry than the other European armies, simply because of the difficulty of transporting horses by water, and then the subsequent need to recuperate them on land, which sometimes required several weeks. The British cavalry were largely used to quell protests within the British Isles and Ireland, but on occasion they were used in greater numbers on the battlefield, for example, during the Vittoria campaign and the 100 Days campaign, the latter because the cavalry were only needed to be transported across the English Channel. The cavalry were organised into brigades and then attached to the infantry divisions or columns. It was reckoned that the British cavalry were better horsemen than their French equivalents, but the lack of numbers and the fact that they rarely exercised in battlefield manoeuvres meant that the larger French numbers had superiority. With British ties to the German monarchy, the conquests of foreign land by France and other factors, a lot of foreign émigrés joined the British army during the Napoleonic Wars, with whole units being formed of these men. The largest corps was the King's German Legion. This was comprised of exiles from the German states, and had a total of two light dragoon regiments, three hussar regiments, eight line and two light infantry battalions, supported by five artillery batteries. The King's German Legion was considered to be amongst the best of the forces in the British army, and the units were regularly brigaded together in campaigns. Other foreign units in British service included the Royal Corsican Rangers and the King's Dutch Brigade, the Chasseurs Britannique was formed from French Royalists in 1803. In 1812, the Independent Companies of Foreigners was formed from French prisoners of war for service in North America. However, these French formations were notorious for their desertions. Swiss, Greeks and Sicilians also swelled the ranks of the British Army at various times throughout the wars, and several ad hoc Canadian units were raised with the threat of War of America becoming inevitable. As with all the armies of the Napoleonic Wars, the British Army relied on artillery for support in battle. As with the rest of the British Army, this arm of service was small, but was made up for in its professionalism and training that was received by the artillerymen. As with the other arms, men could not buy promotion, so it meant that professional officers emerged to command. Unlike the infantry, the artillery wore dark blue uniforms, with the foot artillery wearing shakos, and the horse artillery the tarleton, an imitation of the light dragoons of 1799. The artillery used a variety of cannon, from the heavy 12-pounders along with 6-pounders and 3-pounders. Also mixed in were a number of different howitzers used for sieges and firing over defences. The guns needed a variety of different ammunition, but one of the most interesting ones were developed by a certain Lieutenant Shrapnel, whose name is still associated with artillery fire today. In 1784, Shrapnel began developing an anti-personnel shell, similar to canister shot. The canister shot comprised of a tin packed with iron balls, which burst out at the end of the cannon after firing like a shotgun. However, it was only effective at very close range, by which times the guns were practically overrun. Shrapnel's invention added a fuse to the shell, which allowed for the projectile to travel some distance from the barrel before exploding the balls over the enemy. This allowed for the shot to be fired at a greater distance than a typical canister shell, and the range increased from the typical 300 yards of canister to about 1,100 yards for the shrapnel shell. Not only was the range improved, but the velocity of the individual balls in the shell was improved by the action of the fuse exploding, adding a velocity caused to by the cannon firing itself. Canister shot quickly lost velocity as the range increased. In 1803, the British Army enthusiastically took shrapnel's invention. Not only was the shrapnel shell particular to the British artillery, but they also deployed rockets throughout the Napoleonic Wars. During the Anglo-Mysore Wars of the late 18th century, 
the Indians used rockets against the British forces and captured examples were sold to Britain to be examined. Initial trials were unsuccessful, but William Congreve continued to work to produce rockets as a weapon of war from 1804. He found that the rockets then available only had a range of about 600 yards, but he was able to develop a missile that travelled 1,500 yards. He then improved on this within two years with his 32-pound rockets, which were reaching a range of around 3,000 yards. Initially made from cardboard, the rockets were later made with a tin tube containing the explosive gunpowder. By 1813, there were three classes of rockets, heavy, medium and light. In practice, the rockets did not fire further than the traditional smooth bar artillery of the time, and battlefield conditions reduced their range considerably, but their rate of fire was much greater than the artillery. The rockets were largely used by the Royal Navy, but some were deployed along with the army, being used in Spain, at Leipzig and also during the Battle of Waterloo. The British Army was a small force, but was deployed along similar lines to the larger continental armies, with the three arms of service being present. Despite its small size, the army was a professional one that didn't rely on conscription to maintain its size, meaning that the troops were professional, officers achieved promotion through merit, and it was a force to be reckoned with playing a pivotal role in defeating Napoleon at Waterloo in 1815. 